I guess just to start with where the economy is, I'm going to show you a chart uh, in, in a few minutes um, that uh, shows what's, what's been happening recently in, in, in the Irish economy. Uh, and what's been happening is that the economy had a very, very steep decline uh, over the last two years. But what the chart will show you is that recently we've seen, seen some, stabilization, some stabilization in the, in, in the economy. Um, the, in terms of uh, GDP or output, we've probably lost maybe about 12% of our economy in real terms over the last two years. And about half of that is due to directly to house building. Uh, so we've had a, a very deep recession. It'll turn out to be one of the steepest recessions recorded by any economy since the Great Depression. Uh, and as I say, it, just going from 90,000 houses to 10,000 houses alone accounts for half of, half of the drop in economic activity. And then you have a whole lot of builders who are working, don't have any money in their pockets now. A lot, some of them are emigrating. They're not going into shops, and that reduces consumer <coughs> expenditure. And so you consumer, so you've got to add on the indirect effect of the, uh, the, the housing bust on consumer expenditure. And then you've got to say you're not building offices and hotels and all of those things because we have too many of them. So you've got to put that into, into the mix. And so when you do that, you, you really do account for most of the drop in GDP for just in the property, property, market, uh, the property market alone. Uh, it was, and of course what's happening is that the property sector got way too large. We had two bubbles. We had a bubble in, in property prices, and we had a bubble in activity. That is, property <laughs> prices got way too high, completely removed from where they should be, the long-run economic value. And then the construction sector got way too large. We built, we built too much of everything. We built the place for, for the next decade. So we built too much of everything, and property prices were too high. We didn't see that in other countries. In the UK, they had a, a bubble in property prices, and that bubble burst. But the, the construction sector didn't get that, that big. And the same in the US. So we had a double whammy, property prices got out of whack, and the construction sector got way, way too large. Rubbish, Adam. No, rubbish. I'm trying to convince you. Rubbish. So I said I'd show you a graph, and there it is. Uh, it might be a little bit blurry. This blue line is GDP, it's economic activity. Now it includes exports and the multinationals and all that sort of stuff. And you saw this starts in 2000, 2001. So here's the economic boom. This thing's getting higher and higher. GDP is growing. This is the, the part of time. Uh, a, a booming construction sector, uh, booming consumer expenditure, and then the, the, the bubble burst as it always does. It was uh, exacerbated though that went on, in, went on internationally, but most of the cause of, of the downturn in this economy is domestic. It's due to bursting the property bubble. So our GDP, economic activity dropped very steeply, the economy contracted. But what you've seen this year, 2010, is that it looks like the economy has more or less, more or less stabilized. And that can depend on, we don't have the fourth quarter GDP numbers, you only have GDP up for the first three quarters. And it's possible that depending on what happens with the fourth quarter, that the growth might be slightly positive or slightly negative for the year. But it's, it's close enough to zero, it's going to be close enough to zero that really doesn't make any difference. And that's about what was expected uh, in, in December of 2009 when the budget was put down. So if, in December of 2009 when the, when the budget numbers were written down, the assumption was that the economy would stabilize in 2010, uh, and that's more or less, more or less uh, what's happened. Now I said that's GDP, it's all the activity in the economy. It includes activity by, around here by Boston Scientific, the Medtronic, and et, et cetera. Why have you stripped that out? Why have you stripped out the, the multinationals and you sort of got more to the domestic or indigenous economy. Well, that's, that, that's this red line. Again, it was booming, we're building loads of houses, uh, all that great stuff, bang, uh, this falls. This line is still falling slightly, uh, so the domestic economy is still contracting slightly. And that's what you've got. You've got the, the multinational sector, uh, the, uh, uh, the export sector, beginning to grow rapidly, and therefore that's stop the downturn in GDP, but the domestic economy remains fairly, fairly weak. I said uh, the ex our exports are proven strong, well, that's a graph that shows it to you. This is export growth, and so this goes back to 2006, and you can see we had export growth uh, of about 6, 7, 8 percent, 2006 and, and 7. That's, that's not bad, that's pretty good, uh, although it's nothing like the export growth we saw in the 90s. If you go back to the late 90s, our exports were growing about 20, 
25% a year. With a lot of multinationals coming here, with a lot of uh, 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 firms uh, building their exports, and we have very rapid economic growth. Then the global uh, economic downturn hit. Uh, Sterling moved against us uh, very hard for Irish firms to sell into the UK. The foreign countries weren't buying what we produce, and our economy started to contract. And, and, and our economy, were con uh, the, the exports was, were contracting about 2 or 3 percent. Now, it is worth pointing out that um, if you look at other countries, for example, Germany or most other European countries, their exports around this time fell by about 20 or 25 percent. So it, it began to come, uh, there were some hints around here that our export sector, and I'm certainly very worried that what would happen is that the bubble would burst and our export sector has got very fat and flabby because wages have been driven up too high and our export sector wouldn't really be good and it, they would contract just as much as, as, as the rest of activity and then we'd be completely loosed. But it turned out that our exports, although they declined, the decline was fairly modest. There, there seemed to be some robustness in our export sector. Yeah, they had become a little bit flabby, not, not 24 to their own wages have been driven up, but they weren't that, weren't that on the fish. Uh, uh, for Japan, for example, saw its exports decline 50%, and they've got, they've got uh, uh, Honda and Toyota and Sony and all these great companies. And then what happened is that, well, as the global economy began to stabilize, and, and as the exporting firms, and as both multinationals and indigenous companies started to restructure themselves and get themselves fit and get their costs down, and as costs began to fall right throughout the economy, exports started to pick up, went positive. And in the last few quarters, we're seeing export growth of about 13%. So this is very, very strong export market. Uh, our exports turned out to be much stronger, certainly than I had thought they would be, and our exports are growing strongly. And that's what's happening with the GDP, because our exports are growing very strongly, the domestic economy is still very, very weak. Um, what's driving the export growth? Well, is you've got some recovery in, in external markets, but a lot of it is because we have regained our cost competitors. See, we, we lost a lot of competitors during the boom years. Uh, what we did is we were building all, our, all, all these properties and we were, uh, we were spending a lot of money that we didn't have. It was all borrowed money. We didn't know that. It was driving up the costs. We were a small open trading nation. I mean, who, who are we kidding? We depend on our exports. We're a small open country. We're the most open country in the world. Our exports and, and imports are bigger than any other country in the world. We depend on our exports. Yet during the boom years, we said, to hell with that. We, we can just rely on domestic, on domestic production. And that simply wasn't true. Uh, so what's had to happen is because we had come, become uncompetitive, somewhat uncompetitive, we had to get that competitiveness back. A lot, of, a lot of countries can't do that. They're not flexible enough. And what has been extraordinary is this economy has shown a huge degree of flexibility. It has shown flexibility in getting costs down. Uh, firms who compete in foreign countries need to be able to sell their products and compete with uh, producers from other countries. And in order to do that, their cost base have to be have to be competitive. Uh, and, what, what, and so this is a graph that's showing you what's going on with one measure, a very important measure of our competitiveness, uh, unit labor cost. A lot of it is, is wages, but it's wages adjusted for productivity. So it's giving you an idea of what's happening to the cost of producing of producing goods and services for exports in the, in the Irish economy. What the graph is, and it's the EU Commission forecast, for the year, two, for, it's a forecast for 2009 to 2011, what's going to happen to unit labor costs. And all, these are all countries, uh, so for example, if you take Italy, the EU Commission is forecasting, and already, of course, has 2009 and 2010 data, at least most of it, so the forecast is really one, uh, one year. If you take Italy, they're forecasting that uh, unit labor costs will rise around 6 or 7%. On all these blue bars are different countries, and it's showing you that uh, you, you have increases in costs for companies. And the reason you have that, is in part, is because uh, most countries around the world are still paying wage increases. Uh, so in Belgium, for example, you still have uh, four or five percent wage increases. And in addition, you have fairly slow productivity growth abroad because, because uh, it's a typical recessionary time. For the euro area, on average, unit, unit labor costs are forecast to rise about five percent. You'll notice that there's one country in, in this marked in green that's below this zero line. That is, there's one country that is going to have negative unit labor costs. Unit labor costs are actually going to fall, and that's it right here. And it's Ireland. They project that unit labor costs will fall about eight percent over that period. That's a cost uh, uh, cost reductions uh, per unit of about eight percent. 
uh, and, and part of that is, is falling wages, because falling wages is, is, is nobody enjoys getting the wages cut. But, if the cho but, but unless the firms cut the wages, they will not be able to employ more, and so, uh, and, and we'll have to fire people. And so this is, a, this is all about getting these firms more competitive so they can expand. The way to think about this is in terms of an improvement in competitiveness, 5% increase, 8% decline, that's a difference of 13%. The country would see a 13% improvement in competitiveness over the years 2009 to 2011. Now, is that enough of an improvement to, uh, to um, reduce unemployment to, uh, to very low numbers? No, it's not. But it's certainly an important part of the restructuring of the economy and improving the economy. This is going to mean that these exporting companies, and again, they're not just domestic, in, uh, multinational, but also domestic companies, will be able to compete abroad, be able to sell more products, and in order to sell more products, they will have to hire more people. This is what you call export-led growth. <coughs> uh, we had that in the 1990s. It all went away in the noughties because we relied on domestic on consumption and construction. We are going back to export-led growth. The export sector is going to lead the economy out of this. It's like a train. The export sector is, the, is, the, is going to be the engine of, of, of the train. It was the engine of the train in the 1990s. Uh, construction and domestic consumption became the engine. But that was not sustainable. We're going to go back to export-led growth. Now, the issue is, will it, will it work? I mean, so what do you need to get export-led growth? Well, you need two things. The export sector has to be big enough. The train has to be big enough to bring along the rest of all the carriages. So you need a big export se sector. There's no, there's no point having strong growth in a very small sector because it won't bring the rest of the economy. Um, so I heard, for example, I heard President Obama talk about export-led growth in the U.S. Well, exports are only 10% of U.S. GDP. They're a very small sector. So yes, you can have strong growth in U.S. exports, but it's just not big enough part of the economy to, to bring the rest of the economy with it. But if you're a small, open economy, and if export sector is very big, then it can work. If you have a big sector, if you have a big train, and a big engine, then it can pull the rest of the train. Here's what the, our exports are as a percentage of our economy. This is the green line, that's <coughs> Ireland. And here's a few other countries, particularly a few peripheral countries, that have, like Ireland, that have, have, have very serious economic difficulties. Well, what this tells you is, Ireland's exports as a percentage of GDP, that's 100. So Ireland's exports as a percentage of GDP are, uh, in 2006, were about 90%. They are Exports are growing faster than the economy, so they're going to be close to 100%. Now you might think, well, how can it be close to 100%? That means the rest of the economy is basically zero. It doesn't. Uh, the, the way this works is that, because um, uh, exporters import a lot, uh, also import a lot. So, uh, if you, so if you're comparing it to the rest of the economy, you have to use net exports, uh, and it will be a smaller number. But this is giving you a size of gross exports, how big the export sector is. Multinationals plus indigenous companies. Here are some other countries. This, this line, purple line here is uh, the, the average in the EU. It's about 40%. And then you have countries like Greece, Spain, and Portugal. You see they're all around 20 or 30%. I mean, I've heard of people in Portugal talking about export-led growth out of Portugal. Of course, there's a problem because their export sectors are quite small. And if their export sector is small, then it's very hard to have export-led growth. We have a big train with a very big export sector. If it grows strongly, the economy is drive the rest of the economy. So at least that's, that's, that's in place. The second thing you need is you need a big engine, but the engine has to work properly. It's got to be decent. No point on the big engine if it doesn't go any place. So you have to have a good uh, export sector. Well, it turns out that we do have a good export sector. It looks like we have a good export sector. How do I know that? Well, it's, it's certainly doing very well. Uh, so it does look like we have a strong export sector. If you look at the industrial production numbers, it's not just